set of Watchmen, after all we've heard about it from Ian, how, the, how it came about, all its history and everything. I was really curious about it, got a copy, and the title itself was a curiosity to me. I'm like, where did that come from? And I'd already heard that uh, first that it was a sequel, then that it was a, a first draft, so I, I knew the controversy around it before I read it. And I'm thinking, Watchmen, it must be something to do with uh, maybe when Atticus goes down to the jail the night before uh, the trial in To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, and watches over so that nothing happens. I'm like, maybe it's a continuation of that kind of story. But that wasn't it at all. It's a quote from the Bible. And I never haven't been to church lately, I guess. But uh, in the story, Jean Louise comes home from New York uh, on a vacation uh, back to Maycomb. And the intro part of it is is really cute. It's similar to the way the opening style is with To Kill a Mockingbird. Just set, she's a 26 year old woman coming home on vacation uh, after being out in the big city. And all these things transpire uh, with family, friends, community uh, in the process. And she's at church, the Methodist church, listening to the preacher, Preacher Stone, and uh, I'll read you uh, an excerpt from it. it says, because Maycomb's church had for years not been large enough for a good minister, but too big for a mediocre one, Maycomb was delighted when, at the last church conference, the authorities decided to send its Methodists an energetic young one. But after less than a year, the young minister had impressed his congregation to a degree that moved Dr. Finch, who's her uncle, to observe absently and audibly one Sunday, we asked for bread and they gave us a stone. Mr. Stone had long been suspected of liberal tendencies. He was too friendly, some thought, with his Yankee brethren. He had recently emerged partially damaged from a controversy with the Apostles' Creed. And worst of all, he was thought to be ambitious. Jean Louise was building up an airtight case against him when she remembered Mr. Stone was tone deaf. Unruffled by Herbert's breach of allegiance, they played the music differently, <laughs> because he had not heard it, Mr. Stone rose and walked to the pulpit with Bible in hand. He opened it and said, my text for today is taken from the 21st chapter of Isaiah, verse 6. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. Jean Louise made a sincere effort to listen to what Mr. Stone's watchman saw, but in spite of his effort, her efforts to quell it, she felt amused, amusement turning into indignation, displeasure, and she stared straight at Herbert Jemson throughout the service. How dare he change it? Was he trying to lead them back to the mother church? Had she allowed reason to rule? She would have realized that Herbert Jemson was Methodist of the whole cloth. He was notoriously short on theology and a mile long on good works. So that's the quote and where it shows in the book. And then later on in the book, she's looking, at, she's looking back at what she thought about that and she goes through a lot of moral dilemmas that a lot of them are, are racial as well as cultural parts of the story and then farther later on in the book it comes back to her talking to herself you know thinking to herself blind that's what I am I never opened my eyes I never thought to look into people's hearts I looked only into their faces, stone blind, Mr. Stone. Mr. Stone set a watchman in the church yesterday. He should have provided me with one. I need a watchman to lead me around and declare what he seeth every hour on the hour. I need a watchman to tell me this is what a man says, but this is what he means. To draw a line down the middle and say, here, is, just, is this justice 
and there is that justice, and make me understand the difference. I need a watchman to go forth and proclaim to them all that 26 years is too long to play a joke on anybody, no matter how funny it is. And so she's going through a, a lot of turmoil in this book. But it is very, very interesting. I, I'll loan it to you guys. It's good. I don't want to spoil any more of the story. Uh, the consist uh, uh, the difference between Truman and uh, and Harper, and we notice in that in that second novel how consistent it was to the first. So I mean, is that proof enough? Really? Um, so I'm, uh, I, I first want to thank Neptune Grill for hosting us here. This is going to be our last month at Neptune. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Blueberry Patch uh, for allowing this to happen, uh, and uh, Kurt, our videographer, and of course Martha. The she's she is one of the greatest organizers I've ever met. Amazing, she can she organizes amazing things. Anyways. Uh, I want to make mention that we have our Blueberry Patch Volume 1, Edition 2, Sharing to Survive and Survi uh, Surviving to Share. Uh, this was produced uh, by both Peter, the late Peter Duffy and Martha Muzzy, our great organizer. So if she can organize a wonderful little book. And, oh, right, and Kurt did the photos. I'm so sorry. Forget about that. Um, a great team effort, and if they were able to organize a little book, they can organize anything. So uh, one last thing. Tonight is open mic feature, uh, Fuzzy Britches, um, and uh, City of Imagination, Gulfport, literary meeting every second Wednesday, which is this coming Wednesday. Right. So it's a, a Facebook online thing, um, and I also would like to um, uh, to uh, say that I, I, I really appreciate the publicist uh, to allow me to do this particular rendition of uh, Harper Lee. Very difficult at times to get, and I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this to the camera that it's very difficult to get certain people to agree for me to do these things. This is not off the cuff, um, and uh, I'm very glad that I was able to have this happen. So anyways, that's it. Thank you for coming, and I want to see you on, in October. John, this dream's where you belong. Your golden journey now has just begun. With your mother's arms.